a rushing wind, fill this place, fill our hearts, fill our souls. We pray that we'd be focused and attentive to what you have to say to us today, that we would be unified as one body coming together in praise of the King. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Amen. Thanks, Tommy. Thanks, Catherine, for leading us this morning. Thanks, Ray, for helping us put on the armor to be prepared for anything that God has for us today, maybe in the days to come. Welcome, church. Good to see you. I know there's a number watching online today for, through travels uh, or recovery and blessings. Uh, be well. Hope to see you soon. Last official Sunday of summer, not by calendar, but at least by my, my kid's clock, because Labor Day weekend comes, and then that means we're returning to the rhythm of school. Some have already returned, depending on, on your district, and uh, blessings on you, prayers for you. And you know, every time we sing that song, I'm reminded, I'm taking back a couple years ago, when we were, we affectionately called our year in the tent field church, because we went out to the fields, uh, like God's people of old, wherever we could proclaim uh, the goodness of God, the hope of God. Some, there were very few buildings to assemble in other than homes in those days. So often they gathered wherever they could, by, by the riverside or in the fields. And so we went to Field Church. We became a literally a church without walls uh, for a season. And when we sang that song on one, I think, February Sunday morning, it felt like every time we got to that chorus, Spirit of God, blow through the caverns of my soul. The, the wind picked up to the sense of, do we need to hold on to these tent posts to bind them down? And we felt it. We felt the presence of God in a powerful way, something that can't be experienced uh, within a building like this. Now, we are very grateful for it on warm, sunny days or on smoke-filled sky days or certainly in those, when those January and February days come again and we're reminded that we have a warm place to gather, we're grateful. But we are people of remembrance and we want to remember those seasons of life, what God has done for us, who he's always been. Let's be people of remembrance. Really the most uh, common command throughout scripture is remember, remember, remember who your God is. Remember the way he's met you and formed you. That informs how we now live going forward. So next Sunday, as we've done the last couple years, on that Labor Day weekend Sunday, we head back to the field, really, really the parking lot. Uh, but we head, we head out of doors, and we'll do our service outside, uh, hopefully. Weather will be cooperating and beautiful that day. Uh, but it's a chance to remember, for those of us that went through that, that journey, of that year of pandemic in field church. For others joining in with us, uh, hopefully it's just a special Sunday morning to be outside, to see the trees, to feel the breeze, or to feel the warmth of the sun, or, or the slight drizzle upon your head. Uh, we, we, we will adjust for significant weather, uh, but otherwise come prepared to be outdoors that morning. And we look forward to it being a sharing service, so not a traditional sermon or message, but you are the message. So what has God been stirring in your life that you could bring to share with the body as encouragement, as an offering? It might be as simple as a one-sentence statement of gratitude or thanksgiving. It might be more of a story of what God is doing. It might be a psalm or a scripture you feel impressed to just bring and read. So consider that in these moments, in these days ahead, what would you bring to encourage the broader community as they gather? That space will be open to you. We'll sing together, uh, we'll share together, we'll pray together, we'll take communion together, and then we will eat a meal. It's the first Sunday of the month, and so we will have barbecue next Sunday morning following uh, the service. So please, uh, would you join us for that? We will provide the main grilling uh, supplies, and if you could bring a dish, a side dish, a side, uh, a dessert to share, or both, would you do that for uh, your family and others, and we will partake together, we will pitch in together. If you forget, I'm sure there'll be plenty of food, and so you can participate with us, and we look forward to that time together. Mark your calendars. By the way, if you're newer to our community, you're a guest with us, uh, or as the Mountain Ridge community is newer with us, and you're not on the Union Hill Church newsletter, would you do that now by going to the Union Hill Church 
website, uhchurch.org, or seek, searching it in your phone. I don't see really anyone taking out their phones. So that, make, that makes me think, you're already all on the newsletter, so maybe I should just stop this uh, announcement. You need to go to the website and click the button, click the little hamburger if it's on your phone that says join, join the newsletter. That's how we communicate last minute updates. Uh, you can unsubscribe at, at any point, but these events that I'm speaking of are on that. And these are collective uh, co-church events that we are bringing, coming together in. In fact, I think all that was on the newsletter uh, this last week was an invitation for both Union Hill and Mountain Ridge to come gather together in these various ways, to eat together, to celebrate together. So would you join, at least for a time, you can unsubscribe if you would like. Um, and again, no one's really moving, or you're conditioned to not bring out your device because you don't want to see baseball scores or something like that, or get distracted down the rabbit hole of Instagram and TikTok. But you're welcome to do that for these moments. And you can put it on airplane mode and just open up your Bible app and feel churchy if you want. So that's coming. Um, All Church Life Group, one more this Tuesday night. That's just a chance to, again, eat together, to share together, to get to know one another. If you're not in a life group, uh, which is our version of community groups or small groups, uh, there's different names to that. Uh, This is a great opportunity to come to to get to know one another and to help us as leaders discern are we needing to launch a new group this fall because we have existing groups that are continuing uh, and those meet various times throughout the week uh, just for encouragement, to eat a meal together, to share life together, to pray for one another, uh, to do discipleship of following Jesus together. So Tuesday night, 5.30, right here in the, in the lawn area, patio area near the, near the parsonage, we'll be grilling up again. And again, you could bring a, a meal, a, di- a dish to share or just come and receive. S'more sing-along is coming up on the 9th. That's another great opportunity just to come together, to meet people, to sing together. There'll be some good music and for the kiddos and maybe the grown-up kiddos to do some s'mores at the fire pit at the end of the parking lot. Probably some other games and activities happening that evening as well. Again, all of these details are in that newsletter, so you don't have to be remembering everything or writing stuff down. You can get connected there. We usually send that newsletter out on a Thursday uh, of the week, so be prepared for that. Enough from announcement side of what's coming up. Good things as we head into a new season as the fall is coming. Excited about many things in that way. Dismissing kids now with Miss Catherine and Miss Tracy. So if you're kiddo with us, and you're four years old through fifth grade, entering fifth grade in the fall, you're welcome to join in with kids' activities, stretch out those legs, and then come join us again in a few moments as we'll sing and take communion together. That's a regular rhythm for us. Pastor Ray, why don't you come join me? Uh, We want to give an update on this last weekend, uh, just the extended time that we spent. Where are you going to stand? Wherever you want me. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out what okay. space you want, but okay. Um, we spent extended time together as elders on Friday night and then Saturday morning and then invited the broader ministry team to be with us. So I think there were 15, 16 of us together yesterday afternoon sharing a meal together. Uh, this was on the calendar for a number of months as we have been uh, We've ter- coined the term, thanks to Catherine, co-churching. We are co-churching That's right. uh, in this season since really June as you've transitioned yeah. uh, out of your building and are now here. So Mountain Ridge Community Church with Union Hill Church, uh, we have a desire to co-pastor. Uh, we've tried to do that for a decade and a half in the sense of we're pastors called to this city and to this area and we love each other and we love Jesus and how do we encourage one another? So now we're just doing it in kind of one space and a little more proximity. So co-churching is kind of a new thing and there's not a lot out there because so much, so often churches are splitting and moving and dividing away from each other, not coming together and saying, how do we be more one uh, like Christ wants us to be one in this season? And, and so we said, we don't know what that season looks like, and we still really don't, uh, but let's come together for an extended time as joint elders from both churches to seek God together, to share story, to share life, to eat together, to pray together. And we did that Friday night and into Saturday, and, and really to ask that question, God, what do you have for us? We're trying to discern a path forward together. What does that look like? What will that mean? I felt just stirred together with the elders. We, we, we came to know each other more, to love each other more, I believe, to trust each other more. And then we invited the ministry team to come in and also bring their heart and their wisdom and their voice uh, to this journey. And I think 
I'll let, you, I'll let you speak. I have a few other things that I would say. I think it was just a rich time. It was a sweet time. I think some of us wanted a little more clarity and a path to run on. Like, what's that look like? And, and I don't think that happened, but I think deeper things did happen. It was emotional at times. Uh, we, had, we had from tears to laughter kind of in the same moment. So it just get a snapshot of, of that group of 15 or 16. That's not all of the leaders or significant voices that are part of these churches, but it's, it's a good representation. And there's many more, some of you and many who are not even with us today uh, that we would say are clearly uh, invested into these churches and this idea of, for now, co-churching together. So that was a sweet time. A couple more things I could say, but what yeah. would you say? How would you reflect? We're exhausted, I think, a little bit emotionally. Yeah, a little, a little tired. <laughs> um, you know, it, we, we have joined churches, and then I got sick, and then Ben has been on sabbatical, and we just have gotten together and kind of started in earnest together to say, God, what are you doing? What do you want? This is highly unusual, really, yeah. in a sense. Uh, we didn't really even have language for it because we're trying to figure it out, and we're like, it's not a, it's not a merge it's not one church absorbing the other at this moment. It's, uh, it's two churches together, but yet being unified by one mission, right? And so, um, you know, the elders, we got together on Friday and we had a outside consultant, a church planting strategist uh, that Ben knows come in and help us. And he, uh, you know, he, he helped lead our time together and and the first thing we really kind of started off with it was just trying to listen do some listening prayer trying to listen to God together and then kind of come back and and share what we're hearing and and um I gotta tell you my heart is so full like it's so excited about what the future holds and regardless of what it looks like on the outside but the the reality of what God can be doing inside of us and transforming um, uh, it's really, really good. And, and it was just, uh, you know, and uh, elders are getting more comfortable because we can make fun of each other a little bit more frequently. So that's happening. I'm like, yes, this is good. And nobody's, nobody's, nobody's really offended yet. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> it's coming. Uh, you know, in love, it's coming. Uh, but, you know, um, yeah, it's just been really amazing. And then uh, yesterday with some ministry team leaders, and it wasn't a... F- it wasn't a full ministry team leader. It was because it's just the start of something, really. And there's a lot of folks out on vacation or have other things that were going on. But, um, you know, it, we, we just sense that it needs to be a process. And it has to be a open process with the whole two congregations. And every one of you, in the sense, t- to feel free to be able to input back to us. I mean, that was very apparent yesterday. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That was b- explained. That it's, um, you know, the elders aren't going to go cluster themselves one way and feel like, this is God's mission and we're going to go do this. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's a process, I think, that the whole church and churches, as we sense how God is directing us together to, to work this process. So, um, you know, there's... Uh, a reality of us who have been in our space, um, our building for um, 17 years, uh, and I've been in this community for 25 or 26 years now, ministering here in Redmond. Uh, when we closed off our building, there was just, there's this sense, we did it so fast, um, you know, there, there's some grieving that we're doing too, right? And there's, there needs to be space and time for all of that to kind of get sorted. And, uh, uh, yeah, but I'm, I'm just grateful. Um, yeah. yeah. We, we, knowing this timing and ha- did happen quick and me entering sabbatical, we invited this season of, of rest or pause to take, to take a breath, knowing that all grieving and processing doesn't happen in a set amount of time, but recognizing that and just say, receive, receive, listen, be, be posturing yourself toward receiving what God would have to say. And then as I return, as we head into, into the fall, we'll, we'll be a little more intentional. So a season of resting and waiting. And I think we're now entering a season of, of testing and wondering, testing what it looks like to co-church and to co-pastor. And so that season is beginning and the wondering of all that that might mean. And so we are inviting you into that process of prayer. Uh, if you're 
newer or a guest with us, this is more of the personal story, but I hope it resonates with your heart of something unique, that two would come together that, to become one. You know, we know that Jesus is in this kind of stuff from John chapter 17 when he is praying for his disciples. John 17 verse 20, he said, my prayer is not for these alone, but for all those who will believe in their message through them, in this message through them. So that means us and all followers of Jesus for all time. Jesus was praying for. So Jesus was praying for us in this way. And that next prayer, he says to the Father, that they would be one, just as you and I are one. May they also be in us, so that the world would believe that you sent me. Jesus' prayer is that all followers of his would be one. And then he goes on to say, may they be brought to complete unity or to perfect oneness is the translation. So we know there's a sense of this not yet happening, that the followers of God, those that would proclaim the name of Jesus, are not yet perfectly one. In fact, we see it in our world, don't we? So much division and distance instead of oneness. That doesn't mean we're all supposed to be the same, but this oneness of unity that is found in Jesus and the Father. So we know he's in this kind of stuff. He's pleased. We don't know the full path forward or what this looks like to truly co-pastor or co-church for a season. And that's what we're inviting, your prayer, your voices. So ways to do that, uh, all of our life groups that run, our community groups have either ministry leaders or elders or both in them. So please come there and interact, pray together for us all in this journey. Uh, We certainly have opportunities, uh, like I already laid out, to just come together in casual ways uh, from life group night Tuesday to the meal after, the, after church next Sunday to s'mores nights. I know that's not going to dominate just that fellowship time, but those are places to meet and to discuss, to be open with it, to bring questions and concerns. Certainly, you can come to us. I see some of the ministry leaders and elders, elders and ministry leaders in the room today. If you're willing for someone to come to you and ask questions, would you raise your hand and say, I, I was there, I was in the room. <laughs> Come find, come find me, so there's a good, good scattering. Would you come and uh, connect with some of those? Uh, it doesn't have to be just through us, but we are open to. And we're looking for ways to be intentional about just creating more of that kind of space or grabbing lunch or grabbing coffee. Nothing pressing, nothing urgent here. I mean, the urgency is, God, we don't want to miss anything you have for us or want to speak to us. That, that's what we're urgent for. Uh, but it's your timing, it's your will, and I think some of what he's laying on our heart to share now as we enter into a message time, we'll resonate with that same kind of theme. What else? Anything else you want to share on that? Or I can turn it over to you. (laughs) Okay. What has God laid on your heart? We're we're trying to preach one message with two voices. That's our our effort. So Pastor Ray is going to go first, and maybe it'll be enough, and I'll just say, (laughs) finish it, brother. Well, that that just gives me encouragement. I don't know if that's a good idea. (laughs) Um, I wrote some notes down, and... uh, Ben, I think very appropriately, has felt this need for us to, to work together to bring uh, w- one message we're hearing from God. And it's been very um, intriguing for us to collaborate together, kind of meet with God, and then kind of come together and see the overlap of what God's been speaking to us. Um, I just want, by way of, Ben and I have only been together for a little bit up here in front of the church. Um, there, but there's been some significant themes. Uh, when we first got together and we sat at a table here, we talked about this sense that we sensed that God was doing a new thing in our midst. And it really is kind of a new thing. There isn't much precedent for churches uh, you know, coming together, still being their churches, but yet being one, right? Uh, we just don't know of others that, that many. Um, there are a few more that are popping up across the country. There are across the country, there's a few more that we know. I know of one that uh, is happening somewhere down in Eugene, Oregon. I don't know the, the pastors personally, but somebody has contacted, as I've been talking with people, like, go, you need to go and talk to them. We talked to uh, our consultant that was talking. He says he knows of somebody. Somebody wrote a book just recently. We're like, woo, okay, let's, let's keep learning, right? What, what God might be doing in all of this and seeing how he might be doing that with others. Um, I, Ben's emphasis when we're talking about that, it, it is kind of unusual. Uh, we are, are, unfortunately, the church has been known to 
is more well known for splitting over issues than it is for gathering over unity for the cause of Christ, right? And uh, I hope we can be a part of that change <laughs> in our country and maybe in the world, okay? Um, ben spoke, uh, it was last week, he was talking about, he'd been preaching through Exodus and he talked about, uh, this was kind of a natural break where uh, the people of God in Exodus 13 were coming to leaving Egypt out of slavery and they came to the edge of the wilderness and they hadn't entered in yet and they're right on the edge and, and he was just painting this picture that kind of we're like we're as these two bodies of Christ but one body are kind of on the edge of entering into the wilderness like and I think that picture was very appropriate as he was speaking about that uh, and we, we spoke a, a lot uh, the last couple of weeks about seeking his presence doing that personally and corporately Seek his presence. And we talked about how it's revealed in God, God's face and his glory and that his face turns towards us. And one of the realities when he turns his face towards us is we experience joy, right? And uh, so that aspect of us as bodies, as we even do this process that we're seeking his face, we're seeking his presence step by step as we go. And so that's just a reminder, I think, for all of us. Um, I'm going to give you a couple verses here. Here's the, uh, whoops, i got to turn this on. Uh, this is a, a, a verse from John chapter 5, and Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, right? He had healed on the Sabbath, and they were really angry. Like, how dare you do this? Like, this is God's day. Remember, we cease from work on the Sabbath, and we come and worship God. And so we weren't supposed to, you know, work. And then Jesus says this in his defense. He says, um, my father is working until now, and I am working. He's going, uh, yeah, humanity takes a break, but God himself is always at work. And then he's like, and I'm also working. And you, you understand the people that were there, the le religious leaders of that day, when they heard Jesus said that, they were like, What? Are you equating yourself with, with God himself? Jesus was. And then he says this amazing passage, right? He says, truly, truly, I say to you that the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. You hear what he's saying? He's saying, God the father is at work in the world 24-7, he's at work. And he says he, as the Son of God, sees what the Father is doing. He sees it. And then he steps into what God is doing. And he doesn't do it on his own. He does what the Father is already doing, right? And we go, wow, this is kind of crazy. Many of you guys, uh, years past, there was a curriculum called... Uh, uh, blanking. Yeah, thank you. My wife says that. Experiencing God. Have you guys, anybody familiar with that curriculum? Yeah. And, and that was the whole concept of that entire teaching was God is at work. He is at work all around us. His spirit, God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, they're, he's, they're at work. And just as the Son saw the Father working, he would enter into that work. We also are asked to do the same, is to enter into God's work wherever it is that he's working. And I was like, whoa, okay. So this is our, his invitation to us. And how do, we, um, how do we get that sense? Um, the Holy Spirit in scriptures is often referred to, um, some of its similarities is like the wind, right? And oftentimes it's referred to, uh, Jesus does in Pentecost too, in Acts chapter 2, you know, there was a rustling of wind as the Holy Spirit entered into the place where the disciples were gathered. And so there's this sense of like, what, what, how, do we, how do we develop a relationship with God that we sense his movements and we 
walk into that and do as the Father is already doing, as the Son is already doing, as the Spirit is already doing. And, uh, and, and it's just this, um, I think there's this invitation to us to know him. And one of the, clearly one of the ways is to know his word, because the more you know him and his voice is revealed to us through his living word, the more we get familiar with his voice. And his spirit's gentle whispers because they never contradict his word, right? There is a, a, a sm- similar voice, and it goes in that same direction. Right? Um, I have an illustration that I shared uh, yesterday. Um, after I had gotten sick, uh, there was a a three week period and my wife and I had uh, an event planned to go do that I wasn't sure if I could make after getting sick. And I was uh, desperately in need of trying to, uh, uh, wanting to go to this event. Well, what was it? And I made kind of just a, a little snippet of revealing last week and I couldn't get to it last week. But uh, my wife and I, uh, for the first time ever, have decided to do a sailing intensive I've wanted to sail for probably the last 10 years or so, and probably had a first inklings about it about 20, 25 years ago when we first moved to uh, the Seattle area. And uh, I think it's, this place is surrounded by water, so you see boats out there and you're like, I think I wanna try that. (laughs) Uh, I learned points of sail, I learned all those kinds of things, uh, but I really didn't really sail and don't really know how. And then about 10 years ago, I had this desire, and it might, I've joked with our church in years past, I was like, I think I wanna just leave ministry and get on a boat and sail around the world. And, you know, and I, I think our congregation was like, is it because of us? <laughs> you know, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> uh, uh, no, it, ministry's hard, you know? And, and they were, and, and so, you know, there was a blessed person in our congregation, a friend who mailed, us a, mailed me a book on sailing the Northwest Passage at Christmas. And I was like, is this like you're trying to encourage this dream or you're just trying to get rid of me, you know? Um, But any of that started started to turn. And I was like, why am I dreaming about traveling around the world and I've never really even spent any time on a sailboat? I don't even know. I know that, you know, I've gotten sick once on a boat, got seasick, and that was very unpleasant. Yeah, so... Uh, so I know this analogy doesn't hold because some of you have been on a, on a boat and gotten seasick and you're like, oh, you're talking about sailing, forget it, I'm out. Okay. Just, it's an analogy, just hang with me for just a little bit. All right. Here we are, uh, about 85% health, and I'm like, we can't get our money back, we're gone. So we got on the boat, my wife and I together, and we're like, whoa. And there was this, this kind of like, are we gonna like this? Are we gonna get sick? Am I gonna get even more sick and have to be sent home? I was like, all these kinds of things were stirring in our minds. And we got out there, and the first part of our journey together was turning on the motor, how to turn it on, pulling out of a dock, which is all kind of scary. Get out of the dock, get into like some little bit of open water, and then motoring, we were turning the boat, doing all this kind of stuff. I didn't know a boat could turn like that, you know? doesn't, it, the radius is very sharp, it turns very quickly, it doesn't have to do as a car does and travel on the road. It can just, in the water, just do that. And I was like, whoa, so we're doing that. And then we start pulling out and he's like, you know, I don't know if we're gonna sail today because, you know, it doesn't seem very windy. And the San Juan Islands, where we were, um, it's known for not real strong winds. And I'm like, this is, what if this happens all week? Right? No wind. So we started going out there, and then all of a sudden we were out, uh, headed towards our first night's stay, or we were gonna anchor out. Uh, and we were headed out there, and all of a sudden he goes, you guys feel that? We're like, I was like, what, what are you talking about? The wind! He's like, we're gonna turn the engine off, we're gonna get the sails up, and let's go sailing. I was like, all right. Engine still running, getting the sails up. I, everybody's like, nobody knows what we're doing. We're just getting the sails up. We're trying, trying, go do that, go do that, go do that. Everything's getting up. Sails get up, turn off the engine. The boat just 
wind comes and we feel the boat start to be carried. It's an amazing feeling. Really. And then, just a few minutes later, whoosh, no end. <laughs> no end. And, we're, and we just hung out for a little bit. We'll see if the wind picks up. Does it? Okay, let's bring the sails back in. <laughs> hey, and he was very excited. He was very positive, which was like, hey, we sailed today. And I was like, that wasn't much. <laughs> Go to, go to Lake Union, yeah. <laughs> so the next day, uh, when we moored out uh, by Susha Island, which I'd never been to in the San Juans. Like, I only went places where you can get to by ferry, right? You guys have been out there, perhaps. And so uh, we were in this little bay, and it was beautiful and all that stuff. I was just enjoying that. And the next day, we were headed towards Stewart Island, and i uh, never been there either. And there's a little harbor there called Prevost Harbor. That was our goal. That's where we were headed. And we divided up our task. We all started learning. We were trying to, yeah, everybody's learning, you know. And we started to sail out there, uh, not sail, we started to motor out there. And then as we started to get within proximity of Stewart Island out there in the San Juans, the wind picked up. It was tangible. You could feel the wind coming. And it was just, and then it became kind of a steady wind. And he's like, oh, we got wind now. Let's, we're going to sail. So with the engines running, got the sails up, and then people took turns at the helm and did other jobs. And I gotta tell you, when I got behind the helm, the, the wheel of the boat for the first time, a 41-foot boat, you know, half a million dollars, I was like, hey, this is pretty cool. But it got, you know, this thousands of pounds of tonnage with the engines off and the sails filling with wind. The boat starting because we're going on a beam reach, heeling over and going at like seven knots, which is kind of the maximum hull speed of this boat. My God. <laughs> I hope you can feel what I've, I'm trying to convey what I felt, right? And, and I'm like, this sailing life's for me, <laughs> right? And then we continued, and we did different points of sail, and like, that's exhilarating going on beam reach. Downwind sailing is when the, the wind's behind you, and you're going in the complete direction of the wind. And the sails just fill, and the boat calms down, and it's just a smooth ride. I'm like, oh, I like this one even better. <laughs> this, is, this is cool. And why do I share this story? Okay, here's the connection point. God is inviting us to be a part of his presence and work in the world. I don't think the analogy of the spirit to something like the wind is by chance. It's God's divine instruction to us to understand that he's at work and he comes and goes as he pleases because he's God. But he invites us to have eyes to see, a heart and a mind that's prepared to listen to what he asks and to step into that which he asks. And I'm not asking to sail around the world at this point, right? Or to get in the craziness of it. But I am asking in a, in a literal figurative and figurative way. Like, I think God's inviting us to enter more into relationship with him to be a part of what he's doing, right? And so God invites us to seek his presence out, to hear and feel his face turn towards us, to feel his joy in the midst of it, to enter into sometimes stormy times with people and others and situations and sometimes, man, smooth sailing with the winds filled out. Right? You know, this idea of being... Uh, you know, two churches in one. Like, what is that? Ben shared this, and he said this. Um, this is the high priestly prayer that Ben just uh, read for us uh, a little earlier. And it says this. Jesus is saying, the glory that you have given me, Jesus says. And he's praying for his disciples and for all of us. And he says, 
the glory that you have given me, I have given to them, to my disciples and to the, to the believers that are to come, that they may be one even as we are one. I get this. He's talking to whom? Who's Jesus talking to? He's talking to God the Father. He's saying, God the Father and me, Jesus the Son, are one. This is a mystery of the Trinity, isn't it? Three distinct persons, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, but yet one God. There's one God. And he's saying, this reality of me and the Father, I'm inviting now my people to be one too. In that, into this union of the Holy Trinity, into his person. And then, 23, Jesus says, I in them, Jesus saying, I in, in all of you. And now he's, he's talking about, you know, we say we have Jesus in our heart, but, you know, uh, we also understand it's the Spirit who's in us. That they may become perfectly one. So there's an aspect of, like, we as the body aren't perfectly one, but we're, God is wanting to, to become perfectly one. So that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Isn't that an amazing prayer? It's this prayer of unity. And it's this invitation to be a people that is a part of God's work where his wind is blowing, where his spirit is blowing, where his work is being done, that he, he invites us to be a part of the work he's doing. And so, um, I'm just, I, you know, this is kind of this metaphor that I feel like is a part of where our church is. Two distinct churches, EV Free Alliance, Christian Missionary Alliance, we will hold our denominations very loosely in that sense, but, um, but yet one church. One. Around the person of Jesus, over the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So my, my encouragement to us again is, uh, you know, I'm throwing these analogies out, but like, is God, do you sense him at work around you? Not only here, not only when we worship, and I, and I did this morning as we were worshiping, I sensed his presence personally. And I was like crying over here, and I was like wiping tears away. I was like, what is happening to me? I'm such a mess this morning. And then be encouraged. Like, I knew, I did, you know, field church, and you guys had outside, and the wind coming in, whatever you're saying, that chorus. I'm like, come on now. Really? It's yes. God invites us into this, into this life of adventure and journey and presence with him. So I say, let's go on this ride together. Okay. So Ben's going to come and continue. continue the same message. It seems to be a theme of, of wind. Ray sharing a personal story. I, I want to share from the story of Exodus that's become personal. I walked through uh, the entire book of Exodus every day in 2021 and then felt us uh, to lead us as a church through that story of an ancient walking people walking with God and coming to know Him and being formed by Him and that journey being not a linear one, not an easy one, and how many parallels we can receive from it. And we saw last week kind of the edge of the wilderness, but more specifically, if you have, have Bibles or your device and you want to follow this along, otherwise I'll read it for you, Exodus 14, it's that second book in the, in the Bible, Exodus 14, verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to turn back, go a different direction, and to camp by the sea. 
And Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. So now they're being led by God up against the sea and, the, and then hemmed in by the desert. And it's intentional, but it's not a straight path. It's a roundabout or wandering way. Pharaoh notices this or hear, gets word of it and hardens his heart against the decision that was made and everything that has taken place and gathers his army and comes after them. Verse 10, Pharaoh drew near. The Israelites looked back and there were the Egyptians advancing upon them. In great fear, the Israelites cried out to the Lord, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness, they said to Moses. What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt? Let us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. These are the people that God chose, that he loved, that he pursued, that he would form into a people to represent his love to all peoples and to bless all peoples. So, There's hope for us. If we've ever been in this same place, and I think all of us have, when the road is uncertain or roundabout or windy or zigzagging and we come up against obstacles or we come up against this uncertainty that we're either looking for leaders to blame or those that have made promises that haven't been fulfilled, and if that's not present, probably pointing the finger at God. Where are you? What have you done? I thought I was faithfully following you. This is not what I wanted or expected. Any leaders who have felt the impetus to lead change for people entrusted to them, whether that's small on a family level or bigger in a a company or a business or a church, you may feel this, or a school, you may feel this at more of a visceral level. Leading people into change or inviting or calling to new places is uh, not an easy thing. And the Exodus story is like a mirror for us. If we're willing to look into it, we'll probably both see ourselves, and if we look more clearly, we'll see the face of God looking back to us, inviting us to trust him more fully, inviting us, as he does to Moses in verse 13, do not be afraid, stand firm, see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. All you have to do is be still. Easier said than done in the midst of trial or opposition or uncertainty. Then the Lord said to Moses, and here's what I want to press on, why do you cry out to me? Tell the Israelites to go forward. Well, which is it, God? Is it to be still and to wait, or is it to go forward? There is no forward. They're looking into the sea. I mean, behind them is not an option. Tell them to go forward. Where? There's no path. Some of you know the story. God will open up a way. Moses will follow God's command to stretch out his hand over the sea, and the sea will be divided, and you will be able to walk through an unseen path that will become clear, and it will lead to your deliverance. So Moses stretches out his hand, but it's not Moses that makes the way. Verse 22 The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind. There's our theme. All night. We don't know if Moses is standing there all night or if God is clearly just making the way. But nonetheless, it's through a strong wind that a new way is formed. The Israelites went into the sea on the dry ground and the waters gathered up and formed walls on their right and on their left. So they already knew God's presence was with them. This pillar of cloud and pillar of fire by night was with them, unmistakable. Things that God's people should be longing for all the time. God, make your presence known as we've been invited to continue to pray. We don't don't see you in that same way. That was unique. That was special. But God, make your presence known to us unmistakably. And when we come into a place where we're uncertain about the path forward as leaders trying to envision it but not seeing it, God, would your wind blow in a way that we would sense you? Would you make a way that we would follow you? 
I think some of us are sensing the wind. Now, some of us are looking for it, like the sailor on a, on a boat on a calm sea, and the slightest little breeze gets you excited. Others aren't perceptively looking for the wind. We're not even sensing it. It's but a breeze. What is it? So we as leaders are not trying to press this story to be our context, but it's, I think it's inviting us to ask these questions. God, would you make yourself known in such a real way? Would you open a path that we don't even see, that we're only trying to envision? And if you do, will we have the courage to walk forward into something new? But only if you lead the way. Otherwise, we are here to wait and to be still. Are we longing for that kind of movement of the Spirit? that kind of power of the wind, because the presence of God is with us, but will the power of God go forth and make the way, and will we follow? Because where is the army? There's many other ways we can go, many other directions, many other retreats, many other paths, probably ones that we've walked before. Are we actually praying for the wind of God to blow in power, for a new way to go forward and for the courage to walk with him? To do so will require change. It can be both exhilarating. For some, there's an excitement. Lord, please make a new way. There's nothing back for more personally in life. For others, it's incredibly scary. I liked where we were. I like where I am now. I don't want a new way. Really, the journey of following Christ is always into something new. The old is gone, the new the new has the new is greater. It's not always easier. God may lead us in that zigzag way. The path may be a lot longer and harder than we ever expected. So these are the kinds of things that we're praying as leaders, and I'm inviting you to pray. God alone, would you make the way and blow upon us that makes it so clear that we don't move without you, but if you move, we move with you. As his church, as his people, would we be faithful? Would we pray? Let's sing some of our prayers today. Tommy and Catherine come. We try to shape it that way. We are, we are singing praises and prayers. Make them your own. There's words you, can, you can't sing sometimes. Either one, you're uncertain about singing it because it feels like a declaration. Others, you're, you, you, you're, the voice, your voice chokes within you. May it come from your heart that these prayers would become yours. Make them your own as you enter into this worshipful space. We open up the table. We do so every Sunday as we gather. There's elements there in the back. Vegan bread, gluten-free bread. Some have said that's not the best tasting bread. I don't care about that. I care about the table being open to all, that all could come and receive. If you are following Jesus, if you're beginning to follow Jesus, you're continuing to follow Jesus, the table is open for you. When he opened the table for his disciples, they had no idea the path that they were about to be called upon, but they wanted to be with Jesus and have him in them, so they received. Would we be people of reception today? You need to be people of movement because you need to come and receive or go and receive. Take when you are ready individually with your spouse or partner, with your family, Take and receive. Next week, we'll pause and all take together as a symbol of of that growing unity. Today, receive as you are led what Christ has done for you. Be people of remembrance, looking back to what God has done, and let's be people of faith, saying, God, would you open a way that we would walk in it. Make that personal, make that corporate, however you feel led in the spirit. And then Ray will come and give a benediction after we sing. Would you lead us? you to take the posture of worship that just feels